subject is not make the Holy Ghost nor is it cause the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit however you choose to pronounce it or is it go out and do something to manufacture the Holy Spirit but simply let him fall on you. God the Holy Ghost, or God the Holy Spirit, saints, he's all around us. He's everywhere. Actually, he is the active part of the Godhead on this planet. From a physical standpoint, Jesus Christ himself is not here. Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father on the throne of God in heaven. Amen. God the Father is seated on his throne in heaven. The active part of the Godhead, and when we speak of Godhead, the Godhead speaks of the, the, uh, the, the, the Trinity. We Trinitarians are convinced, according to scripture, and it's a very easy argument to make, that there is one God eternally existing in three persons, not three personalities. He doesn't have a mental problem. Three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We see at the baptism of John, where God the Father speaks from heaven, where God the Spirit flies down like a dove and lights upon the shoulders of God the Son, Jesus Christ. We see in Genesis chapter 1, after the destruction and everything, and nothing was here and the earth was void, yet the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. We see in the Bible when God gets ready to create the human race, God says to the Godhead, let us make man in our own image. We see in Isaiah chapter 6 when God needed a spokesman for the Godhead, he said, whom shall I send and who shall go for us? We read the words of our Savior as he speaks constantly. I always do those things that please my Father. I came from my Father. I'm going back to my Father. But if I go, I will not leave you comfortless. I will send you another comforter. And he will abide with you forever. He's the Spirit of truth. He's the Holy Ghost. So it's an easy argument to make. It's the established dogma of the church. Yes, Say amen. amen. So we see in our text that God the Father, thank you Jesus, sends the Holy Ghost to fall on us. And that the active part of the Godhead in the earth is God the Holy Spirit. Jesus will return. And when Jesus comes back in the rapture to take the church out of the world, the church will be taken out of the world. And listen, the, 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 the hindering cause that is in the world who holds the Antichrist back will be taken out of the world at the rapture. That hindering cause is the church and the Holy Spirit in the earth. Paul says, only he who now letteth 
will let until he be taken out of the way. He who now hinders the devil will hinder him until he's taken out of the way. Then that's when the Antichrist will, for a while, move in this planet unopposed. And brothers and sisters, you don't want to be here when that happens. Everybody say, Amen. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. And I want to say this early on. To be filled with him is not hard. We made it hard. Here's what I liken being filled with the Holy Ghost to. The Holy Spirit is like an ocean. He is a huge body of water. And you're in the water. It's very easy if you are submerged in water to get wet. It's very easy for the water to enter your nose, enter your mouth. It's easy for it to drown you. It takes no effort on your part at all. All you got to do is just let it in. And it automatically comes in. The Holy Spirit today is all around you. He's everywhere. He's the ocean. You're in the water. All you got to do is receive him. Let him in. He'll come in. See, we fight him. Somehow, I got to convince God to fill me with the Holy Ghost. Filling you with the Holy Spirit was God's idea. That's his idea, not yours. Praise the Lord. And he is a gift. You don't earn a gift. Praise the Lord. You don't earn a gift. For it to qualify as a gift, it has to be free. Say amen. amen. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. But now, that was not always the case. Look at John's Gospel, chapter 7. I want to show you something. Then, then we're going to preach and... Uh, uh, move on. John 7, verse 37 says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, verse 37 of John 7, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture saith, or he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Parenthetically, but this spake he of the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should not go out and get, but simply should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Christ had not died on the cross at this point. So the Holy Spirit had not yet been made available to everyone. So at this feast, and the feast was the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles was the feast that the Jews held annually, one of three feasts that, that required every Jewish male to return to Jerusalem. It was a big feast. It commemorated God's provisions for the children of Israel while they wandered in the wilderness. Whether God provided water uh, through the rock, whether God miraculously provided food or whatever. God bless you, Sister Celia. Good to see you back. Praise the Lord. You picked a good Sunday to come back. Hey, made it. Good to see you. Praise the Lord. Now, whether God provided water from the rock or whatever, uh, the Feast of, of uh, Tabernacles was a, a ceremony to honor the marvelous provisions of the God of the Bible. Now, uh, one of the things that happened during the Feast of Tabernacles, for seven days, the priests and other Jews would go and draw water from the pool of Shalom. You remember the pool? And they would empty the water in huge booths or basins that were near uh, uh, an altar uh, in the sanctuary by the water gate. And they would take the water 
and then pour the water out as an offering unto the Lord, recognizing his provisions. Now they did this for seven days, collecting the water and uh, pouring the water out. And in the temple, the priest would actually walk around the temple. And while the choir sang the Hallel, they would sing Psalms 113 through Psalms 118. And the water was poured out to God. And it was this great big ceremony. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and it was beautiful to behold. Uh, but the people, because they didn't fully understand it, they were just going through the motions. On the eighth day, no water was collected in the ceremony. No water was poured out. It was on the eighth day, the great day of the feast, when no water was collected, that the living water stood and said, if any man thirsts, instead of going through this ceremony, collecting this water that's doing nothing for you, come to me. Praise the Lord. And I will give you water. Praise the Lord. I'll give you drink. And he that believeth on me, Jesus says, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Any way you look at it, Jesus offered them a better deal. See, the ceremonies were a shadow of the good things to come. Jesus is the real thing. So he says, you don't have to go through these ceremonies anymore. Just come to me. Isn't that wonderful? After his resurrection, but before his ascension, our Lord said this to his disciples. Luke 24 and 49. And behold, I send you the promise of my father. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem. Until you be endued with power from on high. This is after the resurrection. But before the ascension. He says, the promise of my father is something that I want to give you. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 5 and verse 8. It says, and being assembled together with them. Commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For truly John baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. But you shall receive power. Verse 8, he says, because they asked him, said, Lord, now, uh, what will be the sign of all these things? He says, don't worry about that, but you shall receive power. Power after that the Holy Ghost have come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. Let me go back a little further. Some 800 plus years ago before uh, Jesus said it, before Luke wrote about it, before any of these, the prophet Joel said this some 800 years prior. He says, and it shall come to pass that afterwards I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. The prophecy of Joel, the prophecy of our Lord was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost on this particular day of Pentecost recorded in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 tells us, uh, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come, the Pentecost celebration, 50 days after the Passover, and uh, uh, after they celebrated the Passover, the deaf angel passing over the doors of the Jews, 50 days after after the Passover was the celebration of Pentecost. Are you with me? Or better called the Feast of Weeks. And this powerful celebration says when it had fully come, they, the disciples, 
were all with one accord. They were together in one place. And listen to this. And suddenly, suddenly, they had been waiting. Suddenly, amen, there came the sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It was a violent wind. Sound like a hurricane coming through. Praise the Lord. Uh, like a locomotive, a train, all of a sudden took place. Now, where they were, they were upstairs in an upper chamber called the upper room. Down the street from the Pentecost celebration. At this time, Jerusalem, I want to I paint a picture for you. Jerusalem was jam-packed with people. For Jews, especially Jewish males, were in town from all over the known world celebrating the Pentecost celebration. They were not, uh, they were celebrating the Passover. They were not there for what was about to take place. Only 120 were there waiting for the promise of the Father. How many know that God knows how to get your attention? God knows how to cause a stir. So the Lord sends the Holy Ghost and he sounds like a train coming in to that place. Isn't that amazing? Good God Almighty. And uh, it says, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues of fire. Uh, and it said upon each of them, all 120 looked around and they noticed that each person appeared to have a flame burning over their head. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other languages, speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them uh, utterance, as the Spirit of God enabled them to do so. And I mean they began to have church in that place. Now, the 120, where they were, was almost like you could pair that crowd to a rose bowl or a huge uh, football game, Tom, full of people. The stadium was full of people elsewhere. Down the street is where the Pentecost was taking place. Somebody saw what was happening. In that little upper chamber. Somebody saw the power and the tongues and the glory and ran to where the crowd was. So you, you all think that it's happening here. This is not where it's happening. Down the street in this little upper room. Upper room. It happened at the upper room. At the upper room. Everybody say upper Room. room. Yeah, it was at the upper room where this power fell. Say amen. amen. And uh, don't get mad with me because you name your church something crazy. Praise the Lord. This is the upper room. <laughs> oh, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I'm crazy and you're partly right. Yeah, but uh, when this thing happened here, uh, they thought they were crazy too. So uh, the people, the Bible says, uh, in verse 5, and they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. I told you, Jews were in town from everywhere, celebrating. And uh, when they heard about this thing, uh, now when this was noised abroad, I told you somebody heard the multitude, they stopped their celebration. The multitude stopped and were, were, look at this, confounded because they, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. See, the Jews were there from all over, and that was a central Hebraic language that all Jews knew. But Jews were there from Arabia, Pamphylia, uh, Egypt, uh, Libya, Serene, Rome. They were there from all Cappadocia. And all these were different languages. And these Jews who grew up in these other countries 
who were bilingual. They had their uh, Hebraic, they had their basic home language, but they had their uh, uh, language from the, their adopted hometown language. They heard these men who were Galileans. Galileans were known for being thick-tongued, unlearned, brutish people. They were known for being smart and articulate. You would expect the Galilean to be uh, multilingual or bilingual. You expect the Galilean to be thick tongued Galileans. Nobody expected them to be able to speak fluent, fluently in all of these languages. And the people could interpret that what they were saying was praises to God. And then somebody said, are these men drunk? How can these people who are Galileans do such a thing? Are you with me? And uh, Peter stood up. And uh, with the 11, and uh, I told you, if you're a real preacher, you lift your voice. The Bible says, lifting up his voice. I don't understand these whispering preachers. Lifting uh, up his voice. And said unto them, to them, ye men of Judea, Judea, and all ye dwellers at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these men are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing that it is but the third hour of the day. It's, it's just 9 a.m. It's too early. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I just read it to you some 800 plus years ago. This is that, that it would come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I would pour out my spirit upon, let me teach you here, all flesh. See, that's the key, all flesh. The Holy Spirit has always been available, but he was not available to all flesh. Only prophets and kings could have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moved on Samuel. The Holy Spirit moved on Samson. The Holy Spirit moved on the prophets. The Holy Spirit would move on the kings. But the common people could not get the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches on the day of Pentecost, God leveled the playing field. God made the Holy Ghost available to everybody. A big thank you goes in that. And not only did he make, make the Holy Spirit available to everybody, he even, you know what he did? He even uh, went beyond sex and he went beyond class. Notice what he says. I pour out my spirit upon all flesh and sons and daughters shall prophesy. They'll go to preaching. Amen. And your young men shall uh, see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Isn't that something? Praise the Lord. And these things would be spirit inspired. Now, uh, it's not designed, it was not designed for you to assume that because he said to the young man, you would see visions and the old men would dream dreams, that the visions are superior to the dreams and the dreams are inferior to the vision. You're missing the point. What he's talking about is how the Holy Spirit would affect people. That how he would, he would move on young men and old. And not only young men and young women, not only sons and daughters, but to make sure, praise the Lord, you don't think that this is a class thing. He says, and on my servants and on my handmaidens, amen, will I pour out of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Isn't that something? So, this is uh, what this was the fulfillment of uh, the prophecy. After he, the Holy Ghost was given, God Almighty. After he was given, God wanted his mighty servant Cornelius to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody say Cornelius. Cornelius. 
I'm moving right along. Now I'm introducing someone else into the text. Cornelius, it was Cornelius' house where Peter preached. If you look at Acts chapter 10, I'm going to read something, then I'm going to tell you something about this guy. Are you, are you, are you being blessed? Yeah. Acts 10 and 1 says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. A centurion, which tells you a non-Jew, a Roman soldier. A centurion uh, of the Italian band. Now we learn some things about him. He was a devout man. Check. And one that feared God with all his house. A man who was devout, feared God. Check this out. Brothers, brother man, dads, he made sure that his whole household was in church. Brothers, Cornelius, his wife didn't have to lead him. Some of you brothers, if she got to fuss with you every Sunday. I'm not getting any help. You ought to grow out of being slowful. Pam, the doctor convinced me to attend church. The things of God. I have too much pride for that. Part of being a man is leading your family to heaven. Being the example. The children ought to hear you pray sometimes. They ought, they ought to see thank you Jesus come out of your mouth. Every now and again. You ought to be able to talk to them about somebody other than LeBron. And Steph. And the Seahawks. And Dallas. Ah, there's more to life than being a sports fan. You're grown, still trying to be hip hop. What's wrong with you? You're the head of a house now. Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. Understood as a child. Behaved like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.